So, um, John Tobias says we can start. Okay, so actually I'll be introducing Danny today. So uh, I'm Ganesh, my name is Ganesh. Uh, Ajar, I'm, uh, I'm from Kosek, but today it's um, Danny Huang who is with us. Um, Danny is an assistant professor at the Department of... Maybe I can let you do my video, sorry, just a second. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, Danny is an assistant professor at the um, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the New York University. Um, he is affiliated with Center for Urban Science and Progress and NYU Center for Cybersecurity as well. Before joining NYU, um, Danny was a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University, um, where I had the privilege to share the office with him and his lovely dog, Mama. Hi, Mama. Um, then he obtained his PhD in computer science from um, University of California, San Diego, UCSD, and he worked on um, using cryptocurrencies to study cybercriminal activities um, during his PhD. Um, then he will today talk about an exciting project um, on empirically studying IoT um, security and privacy at scale. And any floor is yours. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ganesh. We have a fellow Triton here, X Carpet, um, UCSD. Anyways, um, hi, I'm Danny Huang, currently for, this is professor at NYU. Uh, thank you, Ganesh, for the lovely introduction. So, uh, you know, this is actually work with Ganesh. <laughs> All of these work is actually with Ganesh while we were in um, back in uh, Princeton. Uh, well, I'm still in Princeton. Uh, this is me with Ganesh and Frank as we're enjoying a huge pizza with diameter close to one meter. Um, in the shore of New Jersey um, as we came up with new research ideas. Uh, anyways, um, a lot of this work is actually done with Gunesh um, and many amazing um, graduate students at Princeton University and, uh, and faculty there. But uh, today I'm gonna to talk about uh, IOTs. So um, IOTs, there are many definitions of IOT. Um, I tend to think about it as like, you know, smart devices that kind of small, that kind of sits around in your houses that just sit there and work with you in, in day day to day lives, like smart TVs, cameras, garage door openers, whatnot. And um, there's lots of news reports about how these smart devices are just watching us and spying on us all the time. But today, I'm going to talk about a way of how we watch these IoT devices instead. Um, this talk is meant to be interactive, so uh, if you have any questions, please, please um, just type your questions in the chat or just jump in and talk about it. I have two windows, one here, um, one here that I'm looking at the, the chat anyways. So IOTs. So just give you an example of the kinds of um, IOT devices that are watching us. Here's one example of a Roku smart TV. So here I was in the office watching um, a news app on the Roku smart TV. So Roku actually has one of the largest market share in terms of smart TV in the United States. So here I was just watching the news app, it's called CBSN um, on the Roku TV, just passively streaming the news. And at the back, I had a traffic monitoring software running in the background at the same time. And this monitoring software produces a real-time chart of what the TV is up to. So on the vertical axis, it's the number of kilobits per second sent by the TV. And on the horizontal axis is time played at 10 times the speed. Um, each color bar in the chart denotes a unique um, third party advertising and tracking service that a TV was contacting. There are like multiple colors in terms of the colored bars and the most prominent one is actually in pink, Adobe Marketing Cloud. Just so that you know, I was just passively watching the CBS News on the CBS News app on Roku TV without doing anything. I wasn't even touching the remote control button, anything. And the TV was talking to what, three or four different um, third-party advertising and tracking services. So um, what was it doing? It's a little creepy, right? So turns out that this is just tip of the iceberg. This is the tip of the iceberg in terms of what kind of um, security and privacy problems that you know IoT devices um, face these days. So in general, we are surrounded by smart home devices, IoT devices like smart light bulbs, smart cameras. We're concerned. Consumers are concerned basically, you know, about 
what data is being sent by these smart devices? What devices are sending this data? And to whom, to what companies these smart devices are sending the data? Many consumers are concerned because many of these smart devices are proprietary, they're black boxes. We don't know how they work. We don't know what they're doing behind the scenes. So one way to figure out what these devices are doing behind the scene is actually to study them in the lab. Um, let's say that you know, a typical example is that you know, uh, we can set up a computer connected to the router in the lab uh, through ethernet cable. And on the computer, we run TCP dump. And a computer creates a Wi-Fi hotspot where we connect some IoT device. And it's, let's say in this case, we're interested in a smart camera. So we connect a smart camera to the Wi-Fi hotspot created by the computer. So we look at TCP dump uh, traffic and we ask questions like, you know, are connections encrypted? Um, which internet service or internet services is the device talking to, you know, are these internet services, uh, um, say, advertising and tracking companies? And what data is being sent by this device? So this is just for one camera, one single camera. And there are lots of other cameras in the world, um, including, you know, names you probably heard of, like Google, Amazon, Samsung, or names that are probably, you're probably less familiar with, like Xiaomi, Dahua, Hikvision. So Dahua and Hikvision turned out to be, you know, one of the largest camera makers in the world by market share, and they're based in China. So let's say you want to study, you know, um, security and privacy of cameras. You can buy, you know, cameras from Google, Amazon, Dahua, Xiaomi, Hikvision to, get, to kind of get a, a sense of what cameras do in, in terms of the network traffic they send. But these are just six cameras. There are many, many, many other device makers that make smart cameras. And how can you be you know, sure that your, your study would make sense for, would be transfer, the results of your study would be transferable to many other smart camera makers? And we're just talking about cameras here. There are many other kinds of smart devices like light bulbs. And even for light bulbs, there are like different kinds of makers. And beyond light bulbs, there are what? Garage door openers. There are like smart toilets, smart TV, smart cars, smart whatever, smart coffee makers, different kinds of devices. It's difficult to just buy all of them in the lab to study them. It's difficult to buy them all and study their, you know, their TCP dump network traffic and see what's going on. So one way to counter this problem one way to you know, achieve scale in measurement is to crowdsource. Basically, you know, you know, if you have camera A and light bulb A, come help me. And if you have, if a different person has like camera B and light bulb B, come help me. I can give you a piece of software to run so that you can gather data for me. And I can give you another piece of software to run so they can gather data for me. So this is known as crowdsourcing. So our goal is to just ask volunteers to contribute their network traffic for us so that we can see um, network traffic from different various kinds of um, IoT smart home devices from all around the world as much as possible. But the question is, how do we crowdsource? Do we distribute like a piece of router to individual router to individual volunteers and ask them? But routers is so expensive to build and ship. So what we do here is we want to build a usable tool, software tool that offers insight on IoT security and privacy for our volunteers. I stress the word usable because that's how volunteers will help us. We we'll build a piece of software. So that users can, so that any volunteers, regardless of the, of the technical background, can use it, and the tool should offer them um, insight. You know, this tool should tell them that, hey, you're using this camera; it is potentially insecure because it talks to this company. So that users actually get benefits. So that users get the incentives to help us. And this tool should instead, uh, should in, in return, collect anonymized network traffic for us, so that we can do some interesting research. And the product of this is called IoT Inspector, which you built um, as an open source tool for consumers, for any non-technical consumers. So here's how it works. You can actually go to iotinspector.org today, right now, 
and download a Windows binary. The Mac binary uh, is a little bit unstable right now, but it will be coming soon. But anyways, you can go to iotinspector.org, download a binary, run it on your home network, and a, a browser window will pop up. And then uh, this binary would uh, run a scanner that basically scans your home network. It shows a list of devices in your home. And then you click on one of the devices, you can see you know, some charts about uh, you know, what your smart device is doing at the back. Here we have a volunteer who submitted uh, a chart, a screenshot uh, from, run, from analyzing his Roku smart TV. We can see that on the vertical axis is, t is number of bytes sent per second, and the horizontal axis is actually time, and each color bar is actually a unique uh, third-party advertising tracking service. So this is just one screenshot. It was actually a screenshot submitted by a journalist from uh, um, uh, 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 the National Public Radio in the United States. And um, he actually used his software unaided without our help. And he used his software to write about um, smart TV um, privacy in one of the uh, reports published in 2019. And high level takeaways that um, he found that his smart TV was constantly communicating with advertising and tracking services by just running this piece of software in the back while watching TV for about 20 minutes. So this is just insight from one of the users. Here's another screenshot that you saw earlier, that you've seen earlier about uh, you know a Roku smart TV uh, running the CBS News app uh, in, in at the back. You can see that um, there are different colors of um, advertising services, and the pro most prominent one is actually Adobe Marketing Cloud in pink. So these are just two examples of screenshots of uh, smart devices that users uh, uh, scanned using inspected using IoT Inspector. So how does IoT Inspector work? There are two components. On the left is the client, which uh, uh, you can run on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. No smartphones, just mostly uh, part, uh, mostly computers. And I'll tell you why smartphones will work later. Uh, it's a piece of uh, binary users can run on their computers, where users can view network traffic activities and you know tell us what devices they have. Like you know this is a camera or that is a Roku TV labeled. And all this information, the network traffic and the labels uh, are sent to us, a server located uh, uh, with our control where we can actually see the anonymized traffic and device labels. And based on this server, uh, based on this uh, network traffic, we can do some research, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And um, so how does IoT Inspector work? So one way, one way for IoT Inspector to work is as follows. We can ask users to connect their computers uh, to their routers via ethernet. And then IoT Inspector can create a uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. And then users can you know, reconfigure their smart devices and connect to this new Wi-Fi hotspot so that IoT Inspector can see the traffic. But there are two problems. Number one, think about how many of your laptops actually have an ethernet port. Maybe yours do because you are more technical savvy, but uh, many consumers presumably don't have laptops with ethernet ports. But the, more, the, the bigger issue is actually configuration. If you ever own a smart home IoT device, it is actually a pain to reconfigure these devices to connect to a different Wi-Fi network. If you think about, you know, I have uh, say a, um, a Amazon smart plug here, it costs about 10 US dollars, super cheap. No, to reconfigure this to a new Wi-Fi hotspot, you have to like hold a button like for like 10 seconds until it flashes um, from blue to orange. And then you have to use your phone to connect to it and then reconfigure the Wi-Fi hotspot, uh, reconfigure the Wi-Fi connection to the new Wi-Fi hotspot so, just so that you can, you know, inspect the traffic from this little thing. And once you're done, you have to, you know, hold down a button again to reset the device and reconfigure it to connect to the original Wi-Fi Wi um, network. It's a pain just to reconfigure devices to talk to a different Wi-Fi hotspot. So uh, this technique, while it works, um, it's painful for especially an average user with not much technical background. So what we do here is something different. So our goal is for IoT Inspector to intercept the traffic without user, users doing much. So typically we have you know, smart home devices like you know, on the left is a camera, on the right is a light bulb. 
talking to the Wi-Fi router directly. Our goal is to be on the path of this communication to intercept the traffic. So, and we do so using a technique called ARP spoofing or ARP spoofing. So here's how it works. So IoT Inspector running on a computer right here would um, send out spoofed ARP packets, gratuitous ARP packets every two seconds. It, it first sends a message to um, the camera that says, hey camera, I'm the router, I'm not the computer. It also sends a message to the router that says, hey router, I'm the camera, I'm not the computer. So these messages convince the camera and the router that the computer is not a computer, but it is the other device. In doing so, you know, um, the camera and the router's traffic is effectively rerouted through the computer. And there are cases where um, some routers and some smart home devices uh, don't accept such smooth art packets, uh, and there will be missing packets, and we use the TCP act sequence numbers to infer any missing packets. Any questions so far? Well, I'll take a quick water break. Type your questions or jump in and ask your questions. Uh, Danny, I could ask you a question about this okay. potentially missing packets that you detect through TCP, uh, like acknowledgement numbers. Yeah. Uh, do you like collect analytics data uh, about that? Like, do you know what percentage of the homes or devices or packets you are potentially missing? I don't have the numbers right now. Uh, we, at the very early on, when we rolled out this software, we did not collect how many um, device. We did not collect numbers on how many devices actually uh, having to rely on um, TCP act sequence numbers. Only in the latest deployment, about a month ago, did we push out uh, this particular statistic. So I don't have a quick number for you as to how many people, how many devices actually uh, have to rely on the TCP act sequence numbers. Uh, but anecdotally, anecdotally, we found in the lab that um, surprisingly many devices actually accepted uh, ARP spoofing packets. That included um, um, Google phones, Google devices like Chromecast, Amazon devices, Samsung devices, um, basically many brand, big brand name devices, even including Microsoft, Apple um, devices that were happily accepting our um, spoof ARP packets. And in terms of routers, um, many popular consumer brand routers, including Linksys, Netgear, um, D-Link, they accepted our spoof art packets. Um, but there are very, a small number of routers, ISP routers. I think at that time, I think Gunesh's home routers uh, did not accept uh, TCP ACK, uh, our, our, our spoof art packets. So we had to use TCP ACK sequence numbers to infer the missing packets because Gunesh's router did not accept our spoof packets but uh, I don't have a complete picture of how many devices actually were fooled, but uh, in general, big name devices accepted uh, our spoof our packets. Thank you. I'll talk about this a little bit, but uh, it was surprising to us, you know, just how many just brand name devices were okay with our, our ARP spoofing attack on them. We are basically conducting attack on these yeah. devices. Actually, may I ask you a follow up? Um, yeah. If they follow the protocol or like our protocol, do they need your like? Should they accept? Should they you know accept like spoof packets? Based on the ARP protocol, yeah. So this is known as gratuitous spoof. I'm sorry, gratuitous ARP. It's a way of saying you know typically ARP works by you know if I'm a device, I want to see you know I want to talk to the router, so I ask, hey ARP, who is uh, you know ten dot zero dot zero dot one. And then the router would say that, hey, I'm 10.0.0.1. So this is you know, typical ARP. So I have to make a request, and then the router says uh, who they are. The gratuitous ARP says that you know, without me asking, you know, anyone who tells me that they are 10.0.0.1, I should accept because it's part of the protocol. This is gratuitous ARP. So per protocol, I accept that, OK, you, if you are 10.0.0.1, I trust you, you're the router, so I talk to you. Um, so it's the protocol. Okay, thank you. So this is uh, how IoT Inspector works through ARP spoofing. And because it's ARP spoofing, we don't need any users to do 
anything in particular except just running the software. They don't need to reconfigure their devices. They don't need to use any uh, Ethernet cables. And this allows us to achieve scale. In particular, we are able to scale out. We build a tool, we have a data set, we create some new insights. The tool, we scale out to more than 5,500 5, users as of today. We deployed in April 2019. And even today, we are gathering uh, new users and collecting data on a daily basis. Um, most of our users are anonymous, but some users have come out and told us that, that they're using the software, including reporters from National Public Radio, reporters from Washington Post, uh, especially, you know, uh, Jeffrey Fowler from Washington Post, uh, who told us that uh, they're using, he's using the software to write a, an article on smart TV privacy, again, unaided without our help. And then some other folks uh, emailed us, like uh, folks from uh, Consumer Reports, uh, who um, uh, uh, write reports, analysis reports of IoT devices. <laughs> they told us that they're using the software. Um, and then uh, folks from New York City Cyber Command told us that they're using the software, presumably to um, scan some government devices. We don't know what they're using this for, but they told us that's all I know. Um, so that's tool. And because um, we're able to deploy this tool to many users around the world. In fact, uh, about 60% of the users are located in time zones in the United States and about 28% in time zones in European countries. We're able to achieve, uh, you know, collect a huge data set. In fact, we have the largest known data set collected by any academic researchers of internet traffic uh, from um, uh, um, um, devices. We have uh, 54,000 um, devices traffic. And out of these 54,000 devices, we have about the labels from 12,000 devices. So by labels, I meant, you know, users telling us through IoT Inspector, you know, what the device's vendor is, what the device's uh, type or model is, so that we know that, you know, this traffic associated with, you know, a, a Xiaomi device and is a smart fan or something. And because we have such a unique data set, we have just a large number of organizations requesting data access from us. Uh, in collaboration to the research, including these institutions, as you see here, as well as private companies like IBM and Microsoft Research. Um, we tend to think about our data set as um, an image net for vision research. So you think about it, you know, image net is a collection of labeled images for vision research. And we think about our data set as something similar, you know, we are providing a labeled data set, but for network security research. So ImageNet for vision and us for networking. And we are achieve, we're trying to achieve that particular scale. And based on this data set, we were able to achieve some, do some interesting research, which we'll talk about in a little bit, including, you know, we found some security problems like encryption and exposed local services, as well as some privacy problems like, you know, tracking on smart TVs. So at this point, I see a question from, uh, Hashtag Snowden. The person asks, am I correct in saying that through ARP spoofing, which is a tool for ethical hacking, you could get access to all the traffic packages usually passing through a router? And if so, how do you filter out all the rest of the potentially personal data you can access? So through this question, uh, the answer is yes. We use ARP spoofing to collect network traffic from devices that user says okay. So, um, so the way it works is that, you know, we don't do ARP spoofing on all devices by default. We have to ask users, we have to let users indicate what devices they like to ARP spoof. You know, uh, we don't ever ARP spoof um, traffic for devices that users don't let us do that. Um, and one way, and uh, to protect the, uh, the privacy, we do not collect any um, payload. So just the headers. And also, um, if users are to ARP spoof a um, potentially a, a phone or tablet or computer, uh, IoT Inspector does not do that because he has built-in heuristics to detect what a potential you know, non-IoT device like phones or a tablet would be mm -hmm. to prevent cases where you know, a roommate is spying on some other people in the house. Um, we have a way to mitigate this risk, not minimize, uh, not, not, not prevent, but we have a way to mitigate this risk of uh, our spoofing computers. We basically look at, you know, the OUI, we basically look at various signatures of the device looking for, say, you know, uh, um, 
uh, user agent to see if, it could be, uh, if a device is a phone, tablet, or computer. If that's the case, we don't ever spot our, our spoof those uh, devices. So um, let me know if that answers your question, Snowden. Um, so that's the question. Another one is from, um, yeah, uh, can't pronounce the name, but uh, do you give, the question is, do you give any external entity access to your data set? Um, not yet right now. Uh, I am in talks with uh, Microsoft to, um, to see how we can share this data. We don't have any um, data sharing with companies yet. Uh, regarding data sharing with um, uh, uh, institutions, US-based institutions, we uh, go through IRB. So we have uh, both institutions file IRBs um, to you know, work on the same data set together. Let me know if you have any other questions before I dive into the insights from IoT Inspector. Great questions, by the way. So anyways, back to the slides. So um, there are a few insights from um, this data set. I'll talk about three examples here. Three, uh, but this is just tip of the iceberg, but let's say start with one. One is about encryption. <clears throat> if you think about it, um, one way to tell if a device uses encrypted traffic uh, is to look at what port they sent over. So we, we don't ever look at the the, um, the payload. We can use we use uh, the we use we look at port eighty traffic HTTP as a proxy to say that maybe the device was not you know uh, uh, encrypting the traffic. So in particular, we have about thirty six percent of devices in the data set that communicate over um, port 80, potentially unencrypted, tra unencrypted traffic that covers about 80, 69 out of 81 different vendors, including vendors that make light bulbs like Neutron and Amazon and Roku, which make smart TVs. So that's unencrypted traffic. Many devices encrypt their traffic, but they may not do so correctly. In particular, you know, the, the, the industry standard is to use TLS 1.2 or 1.3, but there are devices that use some outdated version of TLS, like what, TLS 1.0, SSL 3.0, which are associated with known attacks, like what, Poodle and Beast. So for devices that use TLS and SSL, about 10% of them used outdated versions of TLS and SSL. And this covers 26 vendors, including big name vendors like Amazon, Vizio, and Samsung. And these are cases where um, these are smart TVs. <coughs> And the danger is that, uh, you know, with lack of encryption or with improper encryption here, shown here, there's a risk of man in the middle attack. Basically, an on-path attacker can see your traffic, can decrypt your traffic. An on-path attacker includes um, <clears throat> ISP or somebody on your local network that just runs ARP spoofing. So this is one example of the kind of uh, vulnerability that you see of you know, you know, out of these smart home devices, encryption problem. Another problem is local ports. And here's what I mean. Here we have a hypothetical house where at the top we have a home a wireless router, and on 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 the right hand side is a phone, and left hand side is a um, smart light bulb. And one way for the phone to phone app to control light bulb is through direct connections without going to the cloud. So in many cases, let's say that a hypothetical, hypothetically light bulb listens on um, port 80, HTTP locally, and the phone can you know, discover this port through say UPnP and you know, control the light bulb directly through this particular port, turning it on and off. So good, so far so good. But there are many cases where smart home devices have ports that are open for no reason. Maybe they use some software they, that uh, underlying software that have some debugging ports that they forgot to turn off. In this case, we have found many cases of smart home devices having port 22 open, which we never see being it being used at all in the traffic. And having ports 22 open is a major security vulnerability because you know if some devices are to use I don't know some weak passwords, it could potentially enable shell access. And that's pretty bad. So port 22 is just one example of the kind of ports being open on the uh, smart home devices that are never used. In general, based on our data set, we found you know, these are the top local ports that are open on these many devices. 
you know, HTTP, MQTT, you know, the first two, the first two here are most likely for control. Uh, we don't know why SSH and SMB are open and they're present on about 8% to 6% of devices. And out of these devices, we look at what, how many of these ports are actually used. So, you know, out of the 8% of devices that use SSH, 100% of these devices never ever use their SSH ports. In other words, we observe SSH traffic in none of the devices. Similarly, we observe none of the traffic in say Telnet and SMB ports. I mean, well, none, mo almost none. So we read this chart is that, you know, of devices that have uh, SMB ports open based on a TCP um, SYN scan, about 92% of these devices never, we never observe actual traffic to SMB ports. And, you know, I highlighted these three ports because they are associated with potential security vulnerabilities. SMB, by the way, is a Windows, very old Windows uh, protocol for, I think, file sharing. So a few questions here. Um, question one is that, could it be that these devices are old um, and they're not upgraded properly? Uh, this misconfiguration might be unintentional. So we don't know how old these devices are. Uh, we don't know the year and make of these devices. Um, so one likelihood is that these devices are old. They may use old software, old boards, old SDKs. We don't know. But the question, but, but the, the reality is, you know, we have these devices right now in someone else's home around the world in large numbers. And that's the reality you have to work with. Uh, we don't know why, um, but that's the reality. Another question is that, should we assume that all data you process can be defined as personal data? If not, how do you differentiate between personal and non-personal data, um, like machines energy performance data? So we treat every piece of data from these devices um, as potentially personal. Um, we can't distinguish like what is, what's actually in the payload because we don't have access to payload. And we try our best uh, to minimize data collection, like even from the client's end. So IoT Inspector already does not collect anything. It does not even collect the MAC address. It, it randomizes the MAC address. It, it, sorry, sorry, it only collects the, the OUI at the client level and it does not collect anything else. It only collects the headers um, and that's it, no payload. So at the point of data collection, we already try to, we already try to minimize data collection. Um, that being said, there is still a likelihood that some of the data could be um, personal. Say, for instance, you might be you might build your own I don't know IoT network, and then your computer, or your your smart home devices only talk to a particular IP address that you control. Maybe that IP address is you know identifying to you, or maybe um, I I don't know. You know, some devices may um, broadcast their DHCP host names, which you collect for device identification purposes, and those DHCP host names could be revealing of uh, you know what a device's um, identity could be. So there could be chances of um, personal data being collected in this process. That's why we don't make this data open yet. We have a strict protocol of uh, you know, who to work with, how, who to, how to allow um, collaboration between different institutions, if that answers the question. Um, so more questions. Some devices allow apps from third parties to be installed. These apps could be used in secure connections. Can you differentiate? Good, I'll talk about that. So Bart's question is about you know, third-party apps. I'll talk about that in a few more slides. That's a great question. It's a good segue to the next section. Um, another person asks, who watches the watches that watches us? So who watches us? Um, right now, uh, to be frank, we submit a, so the way work, we work is that we have a protocol with the um, IRB, Institutional Review Boards. Um, technically, they don't watch us. So right now it's mostly self-policing. Uh, we abide by best practices. And uh, honestly, nobody's watching us. Um, but the way we design the protocol, how IoT Inspector works is that it's all open source. And um, even if one of the researchers were to go rogue and to, I don't know, release the data and try to anonymize data, we hope that the damage is minimal because even at the point of data collection, we already minimize the collection of personal data. We minimize that. So even if you know, a researcher from our team or collaboration is to you know, run away with data and release it or do something crazy about it, we hope the damage is small. 
So hopefully that answers your questions, but please jump in if you have any other questions through chat or through voice. So let's go to Bart's, Bart uh, D. Decker's question about third parties. I'll talk about that in actually next slide, but bear with me for now. So these are just examples of uh, security and privacy, uh, security insights, all about privacy. So there are many definitions of privacy. Uh, one definition that we use is actually looking at the outflow of data from smart devices to the cloud. And we ask, you know, who actually gets this data? Are they um, advertising and tracking companies? So it turns out um, the, type of the, the types of devices that are, that are the most likely to talk to um, some third party advertisers is smart TVs. So um, out of our label data set, we can identify, clearly identify at least 400 smart TVs in the data set. There are a lot more, but you know, these are the 400 smart TVs that we are sure about. Uh, we, have a, we have a lot more to talk about uh, in, our, in our paper about how we identify devices, but you know, let's stick with these 400 smart TVs in the data set. Out of these 400 smart TVs, we look at the registered domains contacted by these smart TVs. Basically, you know, you know, you know, if it's uh, blah, 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 bbc.com, it's bbc.com that has registered domain. We look at these registered domains, about 22% of the registered domains contacted by the smart TVs are actually advertising and tracking services based on a, a black, well-known blacklist called Disconnect. So a audience, let's take a pause here, an audience poll here. Which advertising and tracking company do you think is the most popular among smart TVs? Is it Google? Is it Amazon? Is it Facebook? Or is it others? Think about it. Think about it as I take a quick water break. Select A if you think that Google is the most prominent advertising and tracking companies by smart TVs. B, C, and others. Let me take a quick water break as I see answers being streamed in through the chat. Okay, we have uh, lots of answers for A, Google, and a little bit more about B, Amazon, and then a few and for um, others, not much for Facebook. Okay, thank you for your guesses. Um, the answer is um, unsurprising, Google. We see 34% um, of smart TVs talking to doubleclick.net. That's rank number one. And then uh, also in top 10 is also a scorecard research. So I highlighted these two companies because you know these two, are, these two companies are also very well known um, in the um, web and app world. So if you go to, uh, I don't know, uh, some website like newyorktimes.com, you will likely see connections to DoubleClick and scorecard research. The third company I'd like to highlight is actually in the others category, you know, Comcast, a well-known um, ISP in the United States. Um, they, so fwmrm.net is a domain controlled by Comcast for video analytics. It is not uh, very well known in the web world, but it is actually in top 10 in the smart TV world. So that's a surprise for us. So we do see some um, relatively unknown players from the web and app tracking world being quite prominent in the smart TV tracking world. But there are a few problems. You know, if you look at, you know, this chart that I showed you a little earlier, we see, you know, communication to different third parties. But the question is, what data is being sent? And going to Bart's question, you know, many smart TVs run third party apps which third-party apps were responsible for, for this traffic? So in the, in the earlier slides, we saw you know, some smart TVs talking to different you know, advertising and tracking companies. The problem is that you know, depending on what app the user was running, the um, advertiser contacted could be completely different. And our data set doesn't show you what apps the users are running and what data is being sent because we don't ever collect the payload. All we know is that there's some smart TV it's talking to some, you know, IP and domain names control uh, owned by an advertiser. Other than that, we don't know anything else. So that is a major limitation 
the IoT Inspector's data set. It gives us the scale, but it does not give us the detail of the traffic, you know, what data is being sent, you know, from what third-party apps, especially for smart TVs, right? You know, these, these devices run third-party apps. So to counter this issue, we need to, you know, step, step away from our, you know, uh, IoT Inspector approach. You know, we, from, from the larger data set of IoT Inspector, we identify what devices are of most interest, in this case, Roku TV, Amazon TVs, and we bring them to the lab and study in detail for traffic that's being sent. So from IoT Inspector, we identify larger trends, right? in this case, smart TVs, and then we buy you know, some of these smart TVs in the lab and study them in detail, especially devices with third, with third party apps. So in this case, we have an example of um, Roku TV. It has well, the largest market share in terms of smart TV uh, and uh, over the top uh, devices in the United States. So the way we study it, we buy it, it's, it costs about 25 US dollars. We, we connect a computer uh, through um, ethernet and then we create a Wi-Fi hotspot and, and we open, we turn on Roku TV. And we use a remote control to open, say, an app. In this case, let's say that I'm interested in watching Asian movies. So I open a, an app called Asian Crush and I use a remote control to scroll through the list of movies and just play some movies. And then uh, I watch the TCP dump traffic. Uh, turns out that if I play one of the movies, turns out that uh, the app was talking to a ad tracking company called Spot Exchange. And the traffic happens to be unencrypted based on TCP dump. If I, you know, if you look through this traffic and see that, you know, things like this is in, a, in clear text, so young and never gone, which happens to be a, a, a title that we're watching right now, a video title we're watching right now. So if you think about it, the video that you're watching at this point is sent in clear text to some third party advertising and tracking company. But the question is, there are thousands of apps on Roku TV, you know, uh, how do you analyze the traffic of TV apps at scale? And you know, in this case, we happen to have you know, unencrypted traffic. What happens if the traffic is encrypted? So we have a question here. I assume that it could be uh, niche trackers, those uh, that are not active in web and target smart devices specifically. How can we identify them uh, if we could not see the payload um, to identify the PIIs? Uh, I don't know what that means, uh, niche trackers. Let's table that and wait for the end of the, the, the call. Um, another question is from Xcarpent. Have you tried not relaying the packets or scrambling the payload? Is an interruption of, is an interruption of device? Uh, I don't understand that. <laughs> Let's stay to the end of the call. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't understand these two questions. <laughs> I'll need more clarification. But anyways, let's go back to smart TVs. Um, so how do you analyze traffic of smart TV apps at scale? So uh, the way we do is we build a smart crawler. Here's one example. We have a Roku TV in the lab. Uh, we have a crawler running on a computer. The crawler would relay the network traffic to the TV. One interesting thing about TV is that um, it's very hard to automate interaction. If you think about you know, web research and app research, there's like known tools for interacting with web or you know apps like you know say if you want to automatically interact with android apps you use adb android debugging bridge if you want to interact with web pages you use uh, selenium or you know puppeteer and other frameworks but for smart tvs it's very hard because most smart tv platforms um, only provide a very simple api to emulate the remote control, like basically, you know, up, down, left, right, you know, okay button, and that's it. You know, we can certainly emulate the remote control to interact with TV, but notice that, you know, this orange arrow goes in one direction because this remote control commands uh, is unidirectional. You know, we can issue the left and okay commands to move the cursor on the remote TV, on the TV, but we don't ever know if these commands are successful or what's being drawn on the screen. Like we don't, there's no API that tell us, oh, this command is works and you know, this box is drawn on the TV. So to provide feedback for our commands, we basically pipe the output of the TV uh, uh, through an HDMI capture card, which costs about $300 US dollars on, on Amazon. And then we pipe the video and audio traffic back to us so that we can see what's really there on the TV. 
uh, we actually have a, a whole paper, a CCS19 paper on how we build this setup, how we actually, you know, interact with smart, uh, smart TV uh, um, app components and how we figure out if a video is being played and how we decrypt the traffic. Lots of work going to this, but for time, we, I'm just going to abbreviate it and refer you to our CCS19 paper and say that we were able to, you know, uh, uh, um, remotely control and grow through thousands of apps on Roku and Amazon platforms in, 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 in this way. Lots of uh, uh, hard work by Gunesh um, and many amazing collaborators in Princeton. And uh, this is all this still in one single slide, unfortunately, because I'm out of time. So the result of our work is that we're able to analyze um, privacy issues on smart TVs. In particular, what private data is being sent from smart TVs with some third-party ad or tracking services. So here we have an example of a Roku TV and uh, the kinds of uh, sensitive data being sent and then the percentage of apps that send this data. We have, say for instance, uh, ad ID, which is an ID generated um, uh, uh, on a per uh, uh, app basis identifies you, uh, and we have many others. I highlight serial number here is because um, this number cannot be reset. So ad ID, you know, if you're, if you are, you know, concerned about tracking, you can reset this ID using um, Roku's um, built-in system. I'll talk about that later. Or you can just reset the device and your ad ID becomes a different number. But serial number is persistent. It goes through the hardware. Even if you reset the Roku TV, the number is the same. This number allows, say for instance, developers of different apps to know that, oh, it's the same person using their apps. So that's why I highlighted um, um, serial number here. Other examples on Amazon TV, something similar. But I'm gonna highlight Wi-Fi SSID. So why do we care about Wi-Fi SSID? Like in my case, my Wi-Fi SSID is what? Netgear, Netgear 237, why do I care? Why, why, why do we care? Well, the thing about Wi-Fi SSID is that um, it potentially reviews your location. There are open source databases like wiggle.net, W-I-G-L-E.net, that could translate a Wi-Fi SSID into a geolocation. That's one source of data. There's also the Google Location API that can translate Wi-Fi SSID into precise geolocations. So basically with Wi-Fi SSID, um, some third-party developers, some third-party companies can potentially infer your exact location. So we actually took a test ourselves, me and Gunesh. We, um, we were in Princeton that time. We just took a Wi-Fi SSID. We entered that into Google's location API. That API was able to pinpoint us to our correct building in Princeton. So that's a really creepy um, data point, Wi-Fi SSID. It's, it's revealing your lo exact location. Another problem is, why do I care about you know, only like what, 2% of apps out of, I think 1000 apps on Amazon that, uh, that send your Wi-Fi SSID to some third parties? Why do you care about 2%? It's like what, 20 something apps. The problem is that these 2% of the apps, these 20 something apps are very popular apps, including what, CNN, Animal Planet, Discovery Channels. These are highly, highly popular apps and channels in US television. We don't know how many people actually use these apps. Our guess is a lot. So I, our guess is that, you know, the ad tracking services potentially have access to the precise location data for a large number of the audience using, you know, these uh, very popular apps. Hashtag student asks, audience question, hashtag student asks, these are information identifiers, meaning that so long as you have such information at hand, any other information becomes personal by definition. So, um, yep. so we do have uh, yep, personal information shared by us. So that's why we guard our data uh, and there are strict protocol for um, protecting the data. So that's uh, you know, the kind of data being sent. So if you think that you know, there could be ways to limit ad tracking. So if you turn off ad tracking in Roku or you know, Amazon, maybe you know, some of the numbers you, you saw on the earlier screen may become zero. Maybe some of these numbers become zero if you turn on ad tracking, if you disable ad tracking. So a quick audience poll here. If you disable ad tracking on Roku and Amazon, which numbers here do you think would become zero? Select A if you think that 
zero percent of the apps would not send ad, ad ID. It's so like B, if you think zero percent of the apps would not send app A, C, serial number, and D, if you think that all these numbers of Roku TV would become all zero. It's quick audience poll as I take a sip of water. Take a mental guess. So uh, most folks say it's A and definitely not D, and you're right. <laughs> if you turn on uh, limited ad tracking on Roku and Amazon, <clears throat> excuse me, only zero, the ad ID will be sent by 0% of the apps. All the others, they're not zero. There are some numbers, but definitely not zero. That being said, though, we don't know, you know, even you know, if serial number is being sent under limited tracking, we don't know if apps actually use a serial number for tracking purposes. We don't know. All we know is that you know, information like the serial number is still being sent. We don't know if apps actually use this information. So that's open for research, how you know, the rest of the information is being used for tracking, if at all, under limited tracking. So, so far, we talked about um, apps in general, apps for adult in, or kids in general. What about kids, children? So there's a privacy law called uh, COPPA, Children Online Privacy Protection Act in the United States. Google and the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Trade Commission um, actually fined, in the United States actually fined Google for a violation, alleged violation of his children privacy law a settlement of more than $100 million. Why? Because YouTube sent persistent identifiers uh, um, from the children-directed uh, videos without uh, parental consent. By children-directed, I meant contents that are mostly geared toward children. So that's FTC and Google and YouTube. What happens in the TV land? Well, if you look at Roku and Amazon, a number of apps that are targeted toward children, we found that dozens of apps also leaked persistent IDs. And no, one note about Roku and Amazon is that there is no dedicated consent process. There was no con dedicated consent process, at least when we wrote the paper in 2019, for, um, for parents to consent to you know, children using certain um, apps. And we have these apps, number of apps that actually track uh, uh, the leak persistent identifiers. And we have a few examples here. For example, um, on Amazon TV, we have you know, these um, uh, uh, um, uh, apps that leak this information. Like if you look at PBS Kids video, it's got 4,000 um, 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 reviews. And PBS Kids, based on my knowledge, is a popular um, kids app. We don't know how many people actually use it, but my guess is that it's a popular app in the United States. Similarly, you know, we have PBS Kids and Nickelodeon. So Nickelodeon is also a, a very popular um, uh, TV channel, children's channel in, in, in the United States. Again, we, uh, Roku does not provide figures as to how many people actually uh, use these apps, but uh, these apps leak some identifiers that could be used for uh, um, uh, tracking. Um, whether these apps actually violated the uh, children's privacy law in the United States, we don't know. Uh, but I actually, gave, I, actually gave it, uh, I actually gave a talk about this issue to the Federal Trade Commission in the United States, and hopefully they're taking um, actions. We don't, I don't know what, what happens to the investigation. So, um, so far, I talked about our tool, our data set, and our insight. We found, uh, you know, using IoT Inspector, we found some widespread issues, security and privacy issues on um, different IoT devices, and then we zoomed in on smart TVs in the lab because IoT Inspector does not allow us to see the uh, actual payload. So we, you know, did some analysis of apps, third-party apps on smart TVs. So that's current work. Um, I know that I'm out of time, um, uh, but uh, here are a few next steps that I'm working on here at NYU. Uh, one idea is uh, Yelp for IoT devices. And this is a particularly useful case where we can actually release some of our data. So here's one news headline from National Public Radio where you know um, some baby monitors are hacked. 
the question is, you know, if you are to buy some smart home devices, how do you buy them? Like Amazon doesn't really provide reviews of how secure a device is. You know, similarly, some government agency wants to buy uh, smart home IoT devices. How do you buy that? So we plan to release the data in the form of, um, you know, uh, what looks like a Yelp review where we tell consumers that, you know, based on our data set, you know, this device uses encryption or does not use encryption or sends the data to some third party companies. Um, so that's uh, our hope. Um, and we hope to understand, try to understand, conduct a, a human research to study, you know, what security and privacy properties do consumers care about in the wild. And we, this is a way of sharing the data uh, with community. Uh, there are some other ideas, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit, but uh, let's pause and you know, take some questions, maybe from X Carpent and others who ask questions that, and Sharon who ask questions that are not familiar with. And then I talk about next steps, like you know, if you have time to stay afterward. 